Okay. Welcome to Bio 241, which is cryptogamic botany. I'm your instructor, Dr. I.S. Kunene. Uh, cryptogamic botany is nothing else but the study of those plants whose reproductive or gametes cannot be seen easily. Hence the crypto. Crypto means hidden. Gamic, hidden reproductive systems. Botany, because we consider all all the things we're going to study to be plants. Some of them will surprise you, never thought of them as plants, but we classify them as plants for this course. Okay. In introduction, I want to tell you how we're going to be, what is expected of you in this course. Every course should have a course outline, and every course should have a list of references. This is university. You don't just rely on notes. We, you are expected to read outside of what I have given you. Now, the references that you have are in a booklet, which I will prepare for you, and it is called a manual. Because this course is robust, there will be two of these manuals. The first manual will be talk, will talk to you about whatever I'm going to cover in bacteria and in fungi. Then the second manual will talk to you about algae and bryophytes. We, I didn't want to make a voluminous manual because then the binding would not hold very well. Uh, we'll try to make the manuals as affordable as possible. Each manual will cost you 30 emalangeni. So if you have registered for this course, please prepare 60 emalangeni cash and buy these two manuals and the essential, it's essential that you have them because the notes or the instruction which I'm going to give you online is assuming that you have these manuals. Okay. What, what is expected from, from you in each of these courses or in each of these topics? I will explain to you what the topic is all about. And most of my explanations will be apparent to you because you will have handwritten notes on the slides. So those slides that are handwritten are my own explanations of the topic. Now, you will also have illustrations. The manual which you will have bought will have many of these illustrations, if not all of them. However, there are extra notes which have been appended to this presentation, and I will uh, highlight these to you and tell you how to use them as we get to them. Um, this COVID thing is new for all of us, but we are told that at the end of the course, you will come back and do practicals and then write tests. The tests will be face-to-face. -face. They will not be online. And the practicals will all be together at the end. This is a new thing for us. Normally, when we do practicals, we do the practicals as we cover the topics. So please bear with us. We're all chattering uh, waters we are not familiar with in this. I wish you the best. Hope you enjoy the course. Now let us start. Cryptogamic botany is a core course in biology. That means it's a course that you must know. And because it is so important, it has been, it has been given four credit hours. That means in a week, you have four lecture hours and a three-hour practical. Please, if you are going to skimp on your, the time dedicated to this course, it is going to reduce your GPA drastically. But if you do well in this course, remember it will be multiplied by four, and that means we are getting a lot of points. So please spend at least seven hours a week on this course. It is very robust. If you don't study constantly, it will end up being too much for you. 
But if you study constantly, as I add new material, you'll be able to cope. I'm hoping that this group will also create a WhatsApp group where you can ask me questions in case there's something you did not understand. I wish you the best. Okay. It, this is a botany class and it's not um, a theology class, but we are going to start, start with the story of creation. But the, the thing I'm bringing out here is the fact that when God created the earth, we all believe there is a God, call it God, call it whatever, but that supreme being was there who created everything. Created it in an orderly manner, but in the beginning, there was nothing. Darkness covered the waters. Please, there was nothing, but there was water. Okay. The first thing that was created was light. So the reason why I'm doing this, I'm, I'm showing you the stages of the changes in the environment, such that as things change with time, the organisms have to accommodate the environmental changes and live with those changes. As we look at cryptogams, we will see that we had Organisms that didn't care at all about light because light was not there. And when light came, those organisms had to see how they utilize the existence of light. And after light, we had the creation of dry land on, in day two. And this is to tell us that land plants are more advanced than aquatic plants. So we, the way we're going to look at plants, we start with the simplest ones that were there and look at how they changed to accommodate the light, to accommodate the dryness of, of, of the land, to accommodate the changes of the seasons, which we are observing here in um, day three. Please note, much as we think we are important, we are the last of God's creation. And this was the mandate that God gave us. We are built in his image and therefore he's giving us the power to create things. And he is giving us the power to subdue the earth. But this is just to tell us that we should use the earth reasonably. It is for this reason that we have to understand what is there so that we know how to conserve it how to make it last, how to multiply it. Okay, so that is all I wanted to point out in that slide. Now, here we have a slide, and this slide is called Comparisons of Classification. All it is just telling us is that let us look at the different ways in which people were grouping from way back in 1883 up to 1974. Well, for many of you, 1974 is also way back, but for us, it is recent. So, but what we observe is that as time advances, this classification becomes more and more robust. This shows our understanding of our environment, the things that we had lumped together. For example, we call this thalophyta. And when we looked at thalophyta, we realized that the things that are called bacteria or schizomycophyta, and these are the algae. Please, these names might be scary to you, but the only way to get over scary names is to say them, to write them, to interact with them. So please, I'll also try and remember your names, but in order to impress me, try and remember these names. They're not complicated at all, I will tell you how you get over that initial scare. Now, if you look, we start with bacteria up here and we go all the way to spermatophytes. These are the simplest plants and with time we get to the complicated plant. Please, let me not use complicated, the advanced plants. Nothing is complicated. Everything is easy. 
Okay, so the bacteria will look simpler, the very water adapted. The algae are in water and a little bit in coastal areas, very few on land, but still in water. The fungi are found on land and in sea, but wherever they are, they want moisture, not not necessarily water. Liverworts, liverworts here, which are bryophytes. Bryophytes will also require uh, water. Uh, pteridophytes, I'm sure you don't know the difference between these two. You will know it when I tell you. But these are more land than these. And then the spermatophytes are the plants that you know and you meet every day. So we are going to study in uh, Bio 241. We'll start from bacteria, we'll cover algae, we'll cover fungi, and we'll end in bryophytes. By right, cryptogamic botany should take us all the way to spermatophyta. But then the volume of the world becomes so much that the time doesn't allow us to cover everything. So when we come to spermatophyta, we normally start with pteridophytes, then we cover spermatophytes because then we can handle that better. Okay, so please, but when we talk of cryptogamic botany, know that normally it goes all the way to pteridophytes. Okay, now let us look at the suggested relationships of all these groups. Um, I like botany because um, I like comics. We draw a lot of things. So that's why here when you see we have written things, I use a lot of color because to me it tells me these things are the same, these things are different. So let's go to the bottom. Um, this is the key. It, it tells you why, where I used what color. Uh, I know some of you gentlemen will not be able to see this and this is different. That is red and this is brown, but it really doesn't matter because you will have this in your illustrations and you will interact with it better. This says that we are not very sure of where all the plants originated. Later on, I will tell you that we think this ancestor is an algae, a chlamydomonad-like plant, but that is up for argument. From this plant, we got the protozoa. From that plant, we then also think we got the myxomycophyta. Myxomycophyta are fungi that are plasmodial. And then the U mycophyta, U means true. These are the true fungi. Myco is fungi. Mixo is plasma. Myco fungi, plasma fungi. Phyta means plant. So once you, you know that phyta means plant, everything here ends with phyta. So that's no big deal. Once you know what the beginning of the word means, then that is no problem. So all these ones that are in black, we are going to cover when we talk of algae. These ones which are in red, uh, uh, with the blue outline, we will cover when we talk about um, fungi. These, when we talk about algae. Here, the protozoa, we're going to talk about them very briefly. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about them very briefly when we are talking about uh, the prokaryotes. All right. Then bryophyta will go uh, from bryophyta. We will then stop at the end of this semester. And in the second sem semester, we'll start with xylophyta, which are the pteridophytes. And then by the time we get to gymnosperms and angiosperms, those are the true seed producing plants or the spermatophyta. Okay, how are we going to handle this um, wide array of organisms? Okay, you have all heard of a, of a study 
Biology means study. Bio means life. A life study of micro small things. Which are these small things that are studied in microbiology? Many of these things are also in this course, but we don't go into detail with them because you'll meet them again when you are studying them as a whole course of microbiology and immunology. However, let me, I've already broken down this name so that it doesn't give you a problem. Microbes, these are all the organisms that we, that, that, that are referred to, but the ones we'll go into detail with are, are the first three. The others, you'll have a very brief note. I've, I've prepared some notes for you. It is just mainly to describe it so that you don't come out of here and say, I don't know what a rickettsia is. I don't know what a prion is. You will know what it is, at least briefly, but not in detail. Now, when we come to each topic, whether I'm talking about algae, fungi, or, or bacteria, one, I will present the distribution. If I don't, please find it. Distribution simply means where are these going to be found. Then the structure or the form is just to say, how will I know if I'm looking at it? And then reproduction, this is our mandate. All created things have to reproduce. And there are two methods. We, we have an asexual process, which is very uh, private and simple. I like asexual processes. Uh, then the sexual process, which some of you are familiar with, and that one means you have to negotiate with somebody else to complete the process. Asexual, you do it alone. Here, you do it with somebody else or some other organism. The economic importance is just to remind us that things are not here for fun. They do have a reason for being here. Some reasons are good and some reasons are not so good. Sometimes we, that we know we have to emphasize the ecological relationship of that organism with the biosphere. Please note that when God said subdued the earth, he meant that let's use it very intelligently. Let's know the place of things and use things the way they're supposed to be used. And here I've given you some of the general attributes of microbes. The negative ones, the things that are, will I say, they are notorious for causing diseases, spoiling your food, polluting the environment, which is why we're all wearing masks now, because the environment has got an organism we don't like. But there are also positive attributes. Without microbes, the rubbish that has been thrown into the environment will be accumulating, but it is not. It, has been, it is being degraded. Biodegradation is thanks to microbes. Then decomposition of organic waste, especially your own personal waste. Even you yourself don't want to see what happens to it afterwards, but the microbes take care of that. Then biological control of pests and diseases. Sometimes when you are sick, you get better without taking anything. It's because even within our bodies, we do have microbes that try to balance our systems. Then you use microbes to produce useful chemicals. Um, we'll talk about these when we get to, 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 to the desired area. But the following areas, I will not even discuss the areas of recombinant DNA technology because you will have a whole course on recombinant DNA technology. But right now we're all looking for vaccines and the people we're looking at are the people who work in this area. Gene therapy is also another area where we send a microbe into the system to try and deliver a special uh, corrective measure. We call that gene therapy. Then we have genetically modified organisms. The rate at which we multiply as human beings is not the rate at which nature can cope with feeding us and maintaining us. So sometimes we have to modify the existing plants, which we look, which we look up to for food, so that 
either they don't spoil or they get uh, uh, ready in a particular time when you want them. That changing of the normal is what they call GMO. Whether it's good or bad, well, that's up for discussion. There is also what we call bioremediation, but normally this is when microbes help us to clean up pollutants. Um, for those of you who have gone to the beach, you know that you enjoy the beach because it is so clean and the water is so clean. But think of what would happen if there was an oil spill. Um, the basic unit of uh, the basic unit of life is the cell, and this is the cell we are more familiar with, the plant cell. So when we are talking up, about plants, this is what you have in mind. Well and good, this is the cell, but this is not the only cell that exists. This is the cell which has evolved. It is different from the primitive cell. Okay, this cell has certain things that other cells don't have. Um, this is the plant cell, and I will not go into it because I know you did it a lot in, in, in year one. So please revise this cell. And look at what it has. I've labeled all the parts for you. And think, review the functions of all these components. Now, this cell is a dividing bacterial cell. You might be confused by the fact that it is already dividing. But look at the lab labeling in this cell and you will see that there are certain things here which you, you hadn't seen before. Okay. Um, this is a bacterial cell, and the cell lacks certain things. In the nucleus, we don't have a membrane, we don't have a nucleolus, we don't have chromosome strands, and therefore that means there will be no spindle formation. It also lacks certain organelles. We don't have chloroplasts. We don't have, and chloroplasts are used for photosynthesis, which we think all plants do. We, we don't have mitochondria, which are for respiration, but still the cell will respire, even though it doesn't have mitochondria. Um, it doesn't have a vacuum, but it, it does dispose of waste. It has no endoplasmic reticulum. Now, our question is, in the absence of all these things, how does this cell take care of these functions? So please, we are going to start looking at a bacterial cell, a cell which is self-sufficient even though it doesn't have certain things. This here gives you a verbal comparison of these two cells. The cell that has a nuclear membrane, which is the first cell I showed you, is a eukaryotic cell. The second cell I showed you, which doesn't have a nuclear membrane, is a prokaryotic cell. This is a table that com compares these two cells. So they will differ in their DNA, how the DNA is packaged and what it looks like. It, they will differ in histones, which are special chromosomal proteins. They will differ in organelles. They will differ in the composition of the cell wall, and they will differ in the way in which the cell replicates. Please read these differences and relate them to the two cells. Okay, let's look at prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are not just one group of organisms. We call all, all of these prokaryotes because they do not have a nuclear membrane. However, they did, they, they, they did not evolve as just one group. There are those that are more primitive and those that are advanced. So we recognize two domains or two cell types. A domain which we call archaea. Archaea already tells you it's archaic, it's old. And then we have bacteria. Let us look at archaea. Archaea 
are prokaryotes which do not have what we call PDG. PDG is a stuff which we are going to find in a bacterial wall and it is not cellulose but it is a, something that makes the wall rigid and it is called peptidoglycan. Okay, those that are called archaea, they live in extreme environments and two, they normally carry out unusual metabolic processes. Now, what are these unusual processes? Uh, they, we have what we call methanogens, those that produce methane from this kind of a reaction. Halophiles, those that live in high salt concentration, uh, situations in which we wouldn't be able to survive. And hyperthermophiles, hyper means too much, high temperatures. These live in extremely hot environments. Now, we, the people who do DNA recombination uh, technology, look at these strange organelles when they're looking for certain strange genes that they want to move from these to something else they want to survive in maybe a polluted environment or a, a, a place that is high salt concentration or a place that is hot. I'm saying it like you can do it, move it, take it here and put it there. It is a long process. It's a lifetime of research, but we appreciate the output of these processes. So with um, climate change, Achaia are taking their place in research. Let's look at bacteria. Bacteria are put together, they've been classified in a, 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 by their molecular structure. They started doing this in 2001. But in general, bacteria in their wall will have this peptidoglycan I told you about. Now, bacteria come in two forms. What we call proteobacteria and non-proteobacteria. The bacteria that you, you are always thinking of is this non-proteobacteria. Let us look at proteobacteria, the bacteria you never think of. Okay, proteobacteria are bacteria that are polymorphic. M morph is a form. Poly means many. That means bacteria that exist in a lot of various forms. I will not go into detail with these. I'll just tell you that they, there are five classes and if, we're, if they were classified by an English person to be A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, up to E. However, we are using the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. Okay, what each one of those is all about, I've given you a short note in the next, uh, on the next slide. Before I leave the slide, let me, however, say something about the non-proteobacteria. The non-proteobacteria, I, I told you, are the bacteria you are familiar with. And for these, we just look at the wall, the thickness of the peptidoglycan. If the wall is very thick, we say it is gram-positive. If the wall is very thin, we say it is gram-negative. We are going to discuss this when we look at the wall. Let's leave it at that. Now, I will not go into detail with this, but I will point it out so that next time when you when you 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 read, you are not lost. Scientists have further studied the gram-positive bacteria and they've separated them into two types: those that have a high ratio of guanine and cytosine and those that have a low ratio of guanine and cytosine. This has a lot to do with the DNA structure inside the bacteria. So don't be confused when they talk about 
GC, uh, high, uh, high, high GC ratio, and low GC ratio. If you see a confusing name that is underlined, this is what we call the scientific name. Okay. Uh, Corinibacterium, mycobacterium, uh, streptomyces, these are scientific names. Please note, with plants, the scientific name is more like the surname, and your name is more like the specific name. Okay. These are the low ratio GNC. Please, I'm reading these names because I expect you to know. I gave you five. You should know at least one. I gave you three. Remember at least one. Streptococcus, Clostridium, Bacillus, Lactobacillus, and Enterococcus. These are, you can't say I have studied bacteria and you don't even know one bacterium by name. Please make sure that you know a bacterium and you know where that bacterium is to be found. Okay, remember when we were here, I told you about these proteobacteria that are A to E, alpha to epsilon. Here they are. I've given you a brief note of what is important to know about them. And I told you when it's underlined, it's, that is the specific name. Please, nitrogen fixing is not the specific name. Nitrogen fixing just means that these fix nitrogen in the roots of leguminous plants. Okay, so that is one good thing we know about them. Okay, and I've changed color when I go to the next one. And uh, explanation with examples. I gave you the gamma one. I explained and examples from there and what they do. Uh, delta, what they are, what they do. You find these in, in, in the sulfur cycle, if you know cycles, um, geographical cycles. Then the epsilon ones, how, how, how do we describe them and what do they do? Okay. These, these, then we have other microbes, which are not, please note, these are not bacteria. There are other microbes which do not fall into the table I gave you earlier. We have small things we call mycoplasmas, chlamydia, spirochetes, rickettsia, viruses, prions, and viroids. Please note, viruses and viroids are two different things. So, in very easy English, I've tried to explain to you what mycoplasmas are. I've underlined the key things that you should remember, pleomorphic, I've told you, pleomorphic means it changes shape. Polymorphic means it exists in more than one shape. Okay. And mycoplasmas will pass through filters that will retain bacteria. That is why even our mass well, for the viruses, that they're supposed to be so thick that actually it's difficult for us to breathe. But we try our best. Um, they are the smallest self-replicating organisms that are capable of a cell-free existence. Please note, um, there are organisms that can exist outside of the cell, but there, there are those microbes that can only exist inside a living cell. Okay, so that will tell you about mycoplasmas. This is telling you about chlamydia and that's a brief description of a spiral kit. It is a coil. So I, I try to draw it for you here. It has flagella at the ends, and it is, I've opened it up, but it can be coiled, but it's an elongated form. It's an elongated structure. Rickettsias, obligate intracellular parasites. That means these things cannot live outside of the cell. Hence the term obligate intracellular. Obligate must intra inside a cell, must live inside the, the cell. They enter the whole cell by inducing phagocytosis. If you don't know what phagocytosis is, look it up. Viruses, 
Uh, they are also obligatory intracellular parasites, and they are made up of nucleic acid and a protein coat. Not that this is the only thing. Sometimes you can find that then it has a membrane, it has decorations like the coronavirus, etc. But all viruses will have a nucleic acid and a protein coat or a capsid. These are the characteristics of viruses. We have a number of viruses. Virologies are caused all on its own. Then we have prions. Prions can get their name from proteinaceous infection. PR, proteinaceous, IN, infectious particle. Just to, to finish the presentation of other microbes, I've told you about prions. They were discovered as early as 1982 by a scientist called Stanley Prusner. Okay. Whereas viruses are protein plus a capsid, these are nothing but just protein. There's no coat, nothing. So that makes them even smaller than viruses. Viroids, they are short pieces of naked RNA. They, they also have no protein coat. Now, how are they different from, you see, prions, only have the protein. Viroids have the nucleic acid. So between viroids and prions, each one is one, one, and yet a virus has a protein and a nucleic acid. So these prions and viroids are much smaller than viruses. Okay.